You might remember uh, seeing a news story about a big rogue wave that was spotted near Euclid. It was in November of 2020. Historically large rogue wave off the island, uh, about 10 kilometers from here actually. And it was the most extreme rogue wave ever detected. There was a bit of a buzz about it. And during the conversations that followed, I realized that I don't know really what a rogue wave is and neither do most of the people I'm talking to about it. So I thought I'd reach out to somebody who did know. This is Scott Beatty of Marine Labs, the company behind the equipment that detected the wave. I talked to him last week about what a rogue wave really is, how significant this one is, and how studying these sorts of waves and other ocean data is helpful to people in general. Scott opens up with a short explanation of what Marine Labs is and how they ended up detecting the rogue wave. We design and build our own measurement sensors that we deploy in the ocean and then we provide data for different things, for ports and pilots uh, to navigate ships more safely, but then also for coastal engineering to design things like new breakwaters or how to protect against sea level rise and storm volatility and that kind of thing. So we had a, a buoy of sort of a trial location off of uh, Amphitrite Bank, which is seven kilometers off the coast of Euclid. And that's in an area where a lot of the fishermen know that there's a Uvic buoy as well in the nearby region. I think that's gone now. Um, and so we actually had one of our buoys near a Uvic one on purpose to try and get a comparison of buoy to buoy, which is always a helpful thing when you're developing new technologies. We had deployed it that summer and it was then um, providing data to us over cell networks into our platform from that summer through the winter. And so it was November uh, 17th, 2020, um, where there was a huge storm. The background waves were six meters. The actual term is significant wave height. And so if you were to go look on a NOAA buoy website or a Environment Canada buoy website, it's all using what's known as significant wave height. It's the average of the highest third waves observed over a time period. Our buoys are out there. They're measuring every single wave undulation. And then over a time period, that chunk of data is then assessed. And the average of the highest third of those is what's called the significant wave height is which gets then sent to different areas or different users as swell height. So it was six meters. Now in like normal wave statistics over that duration, that 20 minutes that we're logging, you're getting a bunch of different waves, right? You're getting the average of the highest third is six meters, but you're getting some smaller ones. You're also getting some larger ones. And so the larger ones typically are about two times the significant wave height. So if you're seeing significant wave height of six meters, you can kind of expect in like normal seas to see one or two 12 meter waves. Uh, surfers will be able to recognize that because often when a set of waves comes in, the first two or three are a certain size and then the fourth or fifth one, they usually come in and they're, they're the ones you want to ride, the bigger ones. So it's kind of part of that variance. I wouldn't say there's any kind of particular order of like the first or fifth or whatever, but yeah, the, the effect of having set waves and, and sets and then what a surfer might call a rogue would maybe be just that biggest one statistically in that time period. And it happens to be roughly double the size of the swell height uh, or significant wave height. That's how we kind of experience the ocean, right? But with rogue waves, what happens is the largest one ends up being more than double the significant wave height. It's defined as a rogue if it's at least 2.2 times significant wave height. So if one individual trough to peak is at least 2.2 times. There's all kinds of rogue waves observed. There's been, you know, rogue waves in the North Sea and there's rogue waves everywhere. Often they're in the sort of 2.3, maybe 2.5 times significant wave height, but it's really rare to have them much higher than 2.5 times. So this one, we're looking at six and it went to seven, almost 18, 16, 17 and a half. Yeah. And so that ratio ended up being 2.9, which is way out on that high end of the ratio and ends up being the highest ratio ever observed. Because of that, we, we observed it, we saw it. We put out a little thing on our website. We weren't that well known back then, but we kind of, we did make a bit of noise about it and it was cool, but we really needed a scientist to look at it and kind of, you know, provide some validity and double check. And so that's why it took a couple of years because what we did is we went to UVIC's uh, preeminent rogue wave scientist named Johannes Gemrich 
And he has also his own fleet of buoys out uh, off the coast and he's been studying rogue wave statistics for his whole career. And so he took our data and started studying it and mining into it and figuring out where it fits in the sort of space of all rogue waves that were ever observed. And so he ended up publishing that in Nature Scientific Reports, which we can provide the link to. It's an open access paper. And that's a fairly prestigious paper. And so that was that's when the media started catching on to it and realizing that this is the most extreme rogue wave ever observed. The height itself being 17.6 meters isn't the highest wave ever observed, but it's the most extreme rogue because its ratio of its height to the background waves was the highest ever observed. How long have we been able to effectively study these? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to measure waves. Um, there was, well, if you look on rogue you check out rogue wave history. There's one called the Droughtner wave, which is um, there was a measurement off of an oil platform um, in the North Sea, and that was a, officially a 25 meter or 25.6 meter rogue wave. But the background seas, where I think, don't quote me, but we could double check, but I think it was like 12 and a half HS, or so it was more like you know just over double. There's also um, wave measuring radars that exist. They're really expensive. You have to have like kind of specific locations to mount them and have to, you know, there's basically a land that has to be allocated to it and it needs a lot of power. Um, there's pressure sensor methods. There's lots of methods, but really at Marine Labs, our, our thing is that we can just put one of our rugged little boxes onto anything that floats and start providing uh, measurements from anything. And so that's really what our kind of vision is, is that we can kind of change marine safety because we can have a lot more data um, from, from the units that we provide. Obviously, the data is being transmitted pretty much real time if it's being sent satellites and whatever. Uh, you were careful with this bit of information because you wanted to get it right instead of get it first kind of thing. Um, in the future or now, if it's applied differently, is there a value to this uh, this technology and those being out there, like for immediate navigation value, could we be preventing nautical disasters potentially from unexpected rogue waves? Johannes Gimrick did uh, with his colleague Leah, uh, Leah Sison, and the Nature Scientific Reports uh, paper that he published has a really interesting uh, potential predictor method for rogue waves. And so it's not really like, hey, we're going to see a rogue wave in 20 minutes hit this location. It's more like this type of sea condition has a higher probability of rogue waves. It's kind of like what you might have with avalanche warning. It's not guaranteed there's going to be an avalanche, but your risks are higher. I think that's kind of the thing that we can take from this and build that into our data systems and into our data processing to have a sort of risk level, rogue wave risk level. And there is some really interesting work there. And I think that's really, uh, really exciting. I know from looking at the website that you're also looking at climactic sea conditions, sea temperatures, and, and other things with the same attachments on the buoys. How do you see that information being applied? Our main user groups are, like I mentioned, ports and pilots and tugboat operators. And then uh, another set of users is coastal engineers who need this data to kind of plan uh, to design infrastructure that's resilient, uh, to effectively spend money on building infrastructure that's resilient. Um, and as statistics change with storms, we know storms are getting more frequent, we need more and more data. So that those are our main two user groups. And then there's some other groups that are interested in marine stewardship, in ocean chemistry and that kind of thing. And so there's been some interesting opportunities to provide other sensor data there. So we have done um, salinity and temperature data for our buoys that, um, for example, we're working with South Nation down in the South Island and, and we're really proud to be working with them to help them steward the uh, waters around their traditional land. And so there's been some interesting um, work there. And so we can see there's a stark difference between in the, in the souk basin versus out in the open ocean, what the temperatures and salinities are, which can affect things like aquaculture operations and, you know, all kinds of other things. Um, there's ideas about kelp farming and that too, which are heavily sensitive to salinity and temperature and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, it can, it, you can go on and on with, uh, with definitely with ocean data. How about locally here? Um, I noticed the picture behind you, uh, Joe's Joe's picture of that's buoy Y42, the one you can see about a kilometer off of, uh, there you go, about a kilometer off of our Amphitrite Lighthouse. 
Um, that's one of one of the buoys that's equipped with your equipment. Uh, how many of them are out there? Are there others in our region? Was that one involved in the this rogue wave, or has it spotted anything uh, really interesting in its in its life cycle yet? We are actively working with the Canadian Coast Guard, and we have installations. So we put our units on top of aids to navigation, like that one, and that can just be part of the fleet providing weather awareness for different maritime uh, operators. And um, we currently have a total fleet, including our um, own flotation, like our yellow smaller buoys and its navigation right now of 25 units. We have one in Nova Scotia and then a bunch up in Prince Rupert. And then we're moving down the coast. We have a whole buildup down in the, in the South Island region and then um, into the Gulf Islands as well. And then we have a, a couple in San Diego but we're actively looking to expand that fleet. And basically we're working with Coast Guards to continue to mount on the navigational aids. And we see that as a way of expanding this data network and getting the data into places that are useful for people. And then this Y42 red uh, whistle buoy, um, some of the fishermen call it red can buoy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, call, buoy. I call it the mooing buoy. Yeah, it's definitely a moaner. Uh, so uh, it, did not measure the rogue wave. Um, so rogue waves don't, they're not like tsunami where they, you know, you measure in one place and then they just keep coming and ashore. They're actually kind of ephemeral. Like they'll happen in one place and then kind of dissipate. Uh, and so it's more like getting a double up of like multiple waves coming together and combining. And that's really more what a rogue wave is about. Like if you shake an aquarium and the waves kind of go back and forth until two of them. But if you shake an aquarium continuously, you'll get that same one every time, right? Whereas with rogue wave, it's just like one and that's it. It actually ends up being a kind of a, a like three or four that happen to superpose together. Um, it's, it's, some of this is beyond me. You might even want to go interview uh, Emrick about this, but um, there is uh, basically it's ephemeral in space and time. So you can't just model it like you would a tsunami. And it's not like if you have a rogue wave seven kilometers offshore, you should be worried about it at shore. 20 minutes later, it's not gonna be somewhere else. Yeah. Y42 and the one that, uh, that detected it were six kilometers apart, probably more. And um, even if they were two kilometers apart, it's very unlikely that they would have both yeah. got it. Even a hundred meters. So we had, uh, there was a, at that time, there was a UVic buoy that I think was three or 400 meters away and it didn't measure the rogue. So gives you a sense of it being a kind of singular event. There's some really interesting stuff being done by Parks Canada. Um, and I think Gemrick's working with them as well, um, looking at like uh, extreme run up. So on days like that day, the rogue wave is measured. If the rogue happens closer to shore, just by chance, then that can actually cause a really extreme run up where uh, the ocean basically comes, you know, right up to the road, starts pulling logs off the road and that kind of thing. And that's where it starts getting dangerous for storm watchers and, and beach goers. And that's when parks tends to shut down the parks. So I guess that's part of the reason that you wanted to bring the experts in and make sure that that data match modeling because you have to be scared, especially for such a new program that you might've just had an error with the equipment or, or interpreting and that's why you needed to take that time. That's right. And, you know, having some third party valid, you know, validity there, having a scientist on your side, who's, you know, taking a look and giving it it's, you know, this is real. One thing that's really interesting is that we actually measure the waves in two ways. We measure them with accelerometers, but also with GPS. And so the fact that we had that backup, we had two methods, and they both measured it, gave us that confidence that it was not just a sensor error. Or, uh, you know, the buoy actually went through those motions and we knew that through two methods. I get um, quite a bit of traffic uh, to my, my channel, my YouTube channel, because I have footage of waves in Euclid that clearly they're saying rogue wave Euclid and they're just finding like a nice bit of wave on the beach when they get to my channel. But there, there definitely does seem to be a bit of a zeitgeist about this thing. There are people that yeah. really want to know more about it. Um, do, do you think there's a specific reason that it's that interesting to a certain group or that it's continuing to reverberate? I think for decades, everyone's known that big waves sell, right? I mean, and so you've got like big wave surfing just exploding in a whole part of the world. And you have um, you know, waves, big waves just capture the imagination of everybody and, and surfing itself has. Um, without even the big wave part, but combine the two and it's just exhilarating for everyone to watch and 
So we know that the surfing community has just expanded super quickly in Canada and around the world in the last little while. So I think there's part of that going on. Um, but the press release that we put out after that Nature Scientific Reports uh, paper got published, that press release really got picked up and ended up in CNN and Smithsonian, BBC, uh, all over. And then I think Nat Geo wanted to kind of wait for a little while and, and see what else was going to come of it and then put in like a bit more of a review of what happened. And so that's kind of why. Um, but it, if now, like basically now, if you search Rogue Wave, I think our thing, our press release, that, that wave comes up uh, second search on Google, which is kind of, kind of awesome. And then like third is like a rogue wave coffee. And then there's <laughs> someone who's paying for their search engine optimization. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, uh, but it was pretty cool. And, and to know that, uh, it ended up on weekend update on Saturday night live. I don't know if you caught that, but that was, uh, I, I almost spit up my beer. I was having a beer at the time and a friend texted me and said, Hey, uh, have you seen Weekend Update? And it, they made a Yo Mama joke out of that wave, which was incredible. I thought it was super <laughs> funny. So, um, you know, it, it was like, you couldn't ask for a better explosion of media attention on it. And yeah, I think the answer really is that big waves sell and everybody's interested in exciting big wave events. I guess there's been some disaster movies lately with uh, big meteor strike waves and stuff like that, that probably... Um created a, a little bit of an interest in them overall as an idea. People are hearing about climate change and rising sea levels and, and that sort of stuff. Maybe there's a certain existential dread that comes along with just the idea that the, that the ocean's still mysterious. And yeah. 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 But hopefully, I mean, hopefully the academic pursuit was a uh, move forward there with that paper and the fact that, that there is a potential now to provide a, a warning criteria uh means that you know vessel operators in the region i don't know who would be out on a day like what you see behind me in a boat but sometimes people are or they have to be and to know that you know maybe they should make a different decision if wave risks are higher i think that's pretty exciting and that's really what we're all about we're trying to uh, improve marine safety with data people who want to know more about who the we are we're referring to our marine labs they can just go to the website well you we can put a link in the thing but it's marinelabs.io that's right. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for taking the time, Scott, to talk about uh, your cool buoy finding waves. Awesome. <laughs> taking Scott. pictures. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do what I can. All righty. Yeah, cheers. Have a good day. Good chat with you.